like to take this final opportunity to once again thank our conference sponsors. The Dennis and Phyllis Washington Foundation, the Foundation for Montana History, Valley Bank, Opportunity Bank, Vital Energy Chiropractic, Montana Office of Public Instruction, A&E Design, and Historical Research Associates. We really couldn't have done this without them. I'd also like to acknowledge the hard work of the hotel staff who have made us feel so welcome here. Please join me in a round of applause for them. And of course, no one has worked harder to make this conference a success than the members of the Montana Historical Society staff who organized sessions and workshops, recruited speakers and student poster presenters, served as moderators and monitors, recorded the sessions so people who couldn't make the conference can watch them later on on our YouTube channel, drove the Made in Montana vans and will be driving folks on the post-conference field trips, staffed the registration desk and the bookstore, and made sure the tech worked. Would MTHS staff members who are here please stand to be recognized? I'd particularly like to single out the efforts of our conference tech team, Ren Enrique and Anthony Shrillo. Anthony's in the back, and Renan over here. Thank you both so much for your work. And of course, our extraordinary conference organizer, Christine Brown, without whom, exactly. Christine is the one who is behind all of the um, wonderful conference sessions, the fact that the conference has run so smoothly. So if you see Christine, please give all of your thanks to her. So we do have the greatest staff at the Montana Historical Society, and I'm so proud to, to be the director of those staff. So it's really always bittersweet when we have to bid one of those staff farewell, and sadly, we're saying farewell to our longtime reference librarian, Zoanne Stoltz. Zoanne is retiring on Monday, but she joined the Historical Society staff in 2006, and she's answered countless questions on Montana history in the ensuing 17 years, helping elementary students, local historians, and doctoral candidates alike. Her knowledge of Montana history, as seen through the everyday lives of Montanans, is bested only by her research skills and her dogged determination to find that last piece of information needed for someone's research project. Zoanne's colleagues in the library and archives share that she handles all researchers with grace, even if they're asking about a time-traveling governor, Custer's gold, the Fen treasure, or their alien encounters. <laughs> if someone under four feet tall came into the reference center and they looked or walked like a kid, Zoanne's face would take on a radiant glow, and she immediately assigned herself of introducing that young mind to the joys of research and the myriad wonders that make up Montana's history. And Zoanne has introduced countless numbers of students to Montana's past. Zoanne's homemade ice cream and her strawberry rhubarb crisps are legendary among historical society staff, never to be replicated, and they will be sorely missed, although there are many of us who may drop a couple of pounds with her departure. <laughs> Zoanne, we will sorely miss your reference skills, your history knowledge, and most of all, you. Best wishes for a wonderful retirement.
For our final presenter of the conference, I'm incredibly delighted to welcome Mark Johnson. Mark received his BA from Carroll College and his MA at Northeastern University in Boston, both in history. He is an award-winning teacher and a fellow with the University of Notre Dame's Institute for Educational Initiatives. Mark has focused his research on Montana's historic Chinese communities and the global trends that brought the Chinese to Montana and their continued interconnectedness with events in China during their time in Montana. He is the author of The Middle Kingdom Under the Big Sky, A History of the Chinese Experience in Montana, which was published by the University of Nebraska Press in 2022. Today, Mark will talk to us about the changing status of Chinese women in Montana from the 1860s to the 1950s. Please join me in welcoming Mark Johnson. Good afternoon, everyone. This is a wonderful conference. I came for the first time a couple of years and I vowed never to miss it. The people are just so engaged, enthused, knowledgeable, curious, positive and supportive. So I love coming to the Montana History Conference. I hear next year it's going to be in my, my hometown of Great Falls, Montana. So that's, yeah, that's interesting and exciting. So thank you for your attendance and uh, thank you to Molly and her team, the tech team, everybody at the Montana Historical Society who su does such amazing work. In fact, Zoan is the reason that many of these sources that I'll highlight today and that I highlight in the book are possible. When I made a connection with her back in 2010 and just her expertise and collegiality made things like this possible. Got to preface it with a couple of things. If I seem a little bit tired, I was on the road last night to Columbus, Montana for a football game. Got back at two o'clock this morning. My oldest son is a senior in high school, so you got to do that Friday night football thing with your kids. And, oh, we didn't win, by the way, sorry. Um, <laughs> And if I seem a little nervous, it's because I've got Gary Wallace, who is my high school history teacher here, and Dr. Robert Swartout, who is my college history teacher here. So it kind of feels like a book report. Um, we'll see if I do better than I, than I definitely did in high school. I, so I, I work on the history of the Chinese experience in Montana. And it's, it's hard to tell the history of the Chinese experience in Montana for a couple of reasons. Not because they weren't here, but because what did they leave behind? So in 1870, with the first territorial census of Montana, Chinese Montanans made up about 10 to 12 percent of the overall non-native community of Montana. Considerable, right? In Helena, they made up more than 20 percent of the non-native community of Helena, Montana in 1870. So, but and getting past just those raw numbers can be difficult because sometimes those counting and those numbers look like this. This is the territorial census from 1870 in Helena. And it's written in you know, cursive that you can see there. And so their identities elude us. Their uniqueness, their personhood, who they were, being able to track them in immigration records because they're only identified, many of them, on that 1870 territorial census in this way. If you can't read it too well, it's quote China man, quote China woman, quote China boy. Derogatory term but their identity is hidden from us in these official government records. You can see, though, that there are Chinese women in Helena. And in terms of that terminology, quote China man, quote China woman, I will use that from the primary sources today. Of course, that's not my interpretive language, but I think speaking from uh, the sources is important. In Montana, in 1870, there were 128 Chinese women but it's difficult to try and find any information on them. Difficult to find information on the Chinese men as well. And in a vacuum of sources, oftentimes what happens is myth, overgeneralization, exoticization fills that vacuum. That was the case oftentimes for Chinese men and Chinese culture in Montana, so you'll hear a lot about Chinese tunnels, opium smoking, Tong societies. For Chinese women, you'll hear a lot about prostitution. And I want to get past that and give them back their personhood, their identity, as much as we can. Indeed, prostitution was a job that many Chinese women took, but definitely not all. But as that took hold, some in Montana thought that it eroded the moral culture. We have Thomas Dimsdale in 1865 talking about these Chinese women. Quote, the yellow-looking bipeds called China women? God save the mark. Debauch our citizens and degrade our community. And so they suffered prejudice from early on. Now, a lot of times we will 
ascribe an overgeneralization that all or most Chinese women in the American West were prostitutes. That's not the case. Before 1875, before 1882, some very important moments in Chinese exclusion, Chinese workers were able to bring their wives in. A Chinese worker was able to bring his wife in from southern China into America, into Montana, before 1875-82. After 1882, it became very difficult for Chinese workers to bring their wife in. But before that time period, it was indeed done. And so a lot of the women who rise on the census and are called prostitutes, maybe they were doing that work and or maybe they were married, maybe they, an overgeneralization was cast upon them. So people like Dimsdale are, are representing that. And others, uh, good name for this next member of Congress, bad sentiment. Representative Albert Johnson of Washington said the ne necessity of preventing Chinese women from coming in is because we do not want to establish additional, quote, oriental families here. And so the politicians said this out loud, saying we don't want Chinese women to be allowed entry to the North American West because we know that then Chinese families will become Chinese American families. And Johnson is saying that's not what he wants. A little bit closer to home, a complicated Montana figure in the Chinese story is Wilbur Fisk Sanders. In 1893, he says, it is not desirable that these people, the Chinese in Montana, shall be multiplied in this country but that they shall be diminished to extinction. <laughs> Thankfully, Montana's Chinese communities did not suffer from massive bloodletting of massacres like they did down in Rock Springs, Wyoming, or on the border of Idaho and Oregon. But this sentiment and the rhetoric underneath that surface was always the threat of violence. And Sanders' point about they shall not be multiplied in this country could be read in a familial sense that families should not be allowed to take root here in Montana. And so we get to the actual numbers of the total Chinese in Montana. I will say from the census information, it's probably an undercount at every census year, but not by a whole lot. Sometimes you'll hear people exaggerate these numbers quite extensively. Montana's Chinese community reached its peak in 1890 at 2,532 in Montana, 2,532 Chinese people in 1890. And then you see a precipitous decline actually enacting what Wilbur Fisk Sanders said of diminished to extinction. Not through violence, but through American laws and things of that nature. The most specific American law dealing with Chinese women was the 1875 Page Act, which sought to ban Chinese women from entry to the United States on the assumption that they were all working as prostitutes. We know that, of course, that sex work was for some a reality, but not for all. And that overgeneralization sought to stop Chinese women from getting in in 1875. Many of you have heard about the Chinese Exclusion Act seven years later in 1882. Well, this 1875 one predated that and started a very difficult situation for Chinese families to take root in America. In Montana, specifically, the ratio of Chinese men to Chinese women was dire. In 1870, for every one Chinese woman, there were 14 Chinese men. Pretty wide gap, the gap widens. 1880, 20 to one. By 1900, for every one Chinese woman in Montana, there are 40 Chinese men. Okay, so, and that's, sometimes you'll hear, well, of course, Chinese culture does not allow Chinese women to go out for work, they need to stay back home in the home village. That's interesting, that's interesting. Looking at comparative places where Chinese went out for work, so emigrated from southern China for work, we see a far closer gender ratio in Australia, South Africa, Indonesia, Malaysia, Singapore, and so it doesn't look that it was a prohibition on women leaving, more so the American laws saying we do not want Chinese women to gain entry. In those areas that I just mentioned, the gender ratio was far closer, okay, in Montana and in the American West, it was difficult. One thing that I did throughout this book is through the help of the Montana Historical Society, a number of letters in Chinese rose. And at the time I was working in Shanghai, China, and I had access to people with a lot of language abilities that could unlock these secrets from the documents housed at the Montana Historical Society. And so in 2012 and 2014, I brought students to work on site at the Montana Historical Society. We had grandmothers and grandfathers and Mandarin teachers back in Shanghai working at this transnational, intergenerational translation project to try and help tell the story of Montana's Chinese as much as possible through their own words. And in the book, in chapter two and chapter eight, it interprets about 350 letters from southern China to gentlemen working in Butte. And we hear the pressures on them. The pressures were immense. 
The pressures from the letters say, send more money, send more money, send more money, come home and get married, send more money. And it's not just a frivolous you know, need to kind of line your pockets. Money earned outside of the region of China where these people came from accounted for 80% of the income for those areas. <laughs> and so laundry workers in Butte, restaurant workers in Helena, Chinese gardeners in Boulder, sending remittances back to southern China were keeping family networks alive, very literally. And so they would come to the North American West and try to earn as much as they possibly could. One of the letters speaks to a guy working in Butte in a laundry and the pressures on him. Quote, you left our country for more than 20 years. Our family eagerly expects you to come back according to the original plan. It will be best that you can get married here. You can have offspring for our forefathers and glorify our family. It is a fundamental family tradition. End quote. And it absolutely is a Chinese cultural tradition, family mandate to have children, to pass on the family line, to inherit wealth, more importantly in a, in a supernatural sense, so that descendants can honor the ancestors who've gone before and keep their spirits happy. And it's absolutely essential that you have descendants who can honor those ancestors. So those pressures on this laundry worker in Butte, come home and get married, that's difficult. Send more money, he's trying as hard as he can. The pressures were immense, but they must have children. We have an example from Kalispell. I want to spread this as wide as I can. Oftentimes telling the history of the Chinese experience in Montana is through Helena and Butte. I want to try and represent as much as we can. A gentleman who was working in laundries and restaurants up in Kalispell in Columbia Falls named Mario came to America, got in before the Exclusion Act and worked as a worker up in northwest Montana for quite some time, has an arranged marriage and goes home as frequently as he possibly can to see his wife and hopefully father children. So back and forth from the Flathead Valley back to southern China. He does successfully marry, he does successfully father two children, but he's forced to work in Montana and cannot bring his wife because he's a worker and it's after 1882. Oftentimes you'll hear that Chinese communities were bachelor societies. I think that is not close to the truth. They're transnational split families, separated by thousands of miles. Tragically, you can see Mario's wife here and his first son. They die in a Japanese bombing raid in 1937. And Mario lives as a widower up in the Columbia Falls area until he dies in the 1950s. So the tragedy of trying to maintain cultural traditions but with American laws and distances and geopolitics uh, coming into it play. Here's Jefferson County and the census from 1900. This is just a snippet of it, but you can see all men, about half of them are married, none of them were able to bring their wives to live with them in Boulder or Basin in Jefferson County. Okay, so not bachelor societies, transnational split families separated by circumstances and thousands of miles. Now, some marriages did happen here outside of Chinese ethnicity, so occasionally a Chinese person would marry a non-Chinese person, but that was difficult. Chinese culture really didn't uh, smile on that, and white culture didn't as well. But in 1873, we do have a newspaper article talking about how a white man had taken a Chinese woman as his bride in Blackfoot, Montana, and it didn't go over too well in the town. Quote, when a white man voluntarily ties himself to a, quote, China woman, and thereby becomes her lawful husband, we consider it a barbarous act. The citizens are greatly incensed at the base outrage perpetrated in their midst and threaten the offender against public morals and decency with a coat of tar and feathers. The newspaper claimed it is the only instance recorded in Montana of intermarriage with the, quote, heathen Chin Yi, and it is hoped it will be the last. This is 1873. Eventually, that would become legally impossible. Starting in 1909, the Anti-Miscegenation Act made it impossible for Chine people of Chinese ethnicity to marry outside of their ethnicity in Montana. From 1909 to 1953, Montana's Anti-Miscegenation Act limited people of Chinese ethnicity. That will become important in just a bit. Okay? Yet the cultural imperative to marry still persisted. And so Chinese men here were expected to have families even if those families were thousands of miles away. Tragically, circumstances in southern China did, did produce a flow of some women coming to the United States. This is the area of Guangdong province in southeastern China. Specifically, Taishan County is where the vast majority of the Chinese who came to the US were from. Very impoverished, very agricultural, uh, very hard times in Taishan County. And those hard times, it was noted, the able-bodied go abroad. The fields are clogged with weeds. 
daughters are often drowned rather than raised. And so the preference for male children, obviously we see the tragic choiceless choices in southern China at that time. There was one other choice though, for a family that was having difficulty feeding all of its children, they could sell a daughter into the Muizai system, it's Cantonese for little sister, and so they could sell a daughter to a family that maybe didn't have a, a child or something like that. Basically, it was hoped that it was a system of benevolence and charity for the Chinese girl instead of the, the alternative. It was hoped that that girl would then serve that family and be freed at 18 and given marriageable prospects at the age of 18. That didn't often happen. That wasn't often the case. Sadly, many of these Muay these little sisters, so to speak, found their way into brothels in San Francisco and into to, uh, human trafficking and sexual servitude in that area. This is during the Progressive Era and a, a white Protestant reformer named Donaldina Cameron working in San Francisco. You can kind of see the angle of that street in San, like the hilly district of San Francisco there, right? Donaldina Cameron does this thing called the Presbyterian Mission Home where she and her reformers will go into brothels and try to extricate girls and women from that situation. And so Donaldina Cameron is trying to save as many as she can from that sexual servitude in those brothels. What they would do is then teach these women English, teach them Christianity, teach them Victorian principles, to quote, organize a home on Christian principles, the first steps upward from heathenism to civilization. What they would hopefully then do is if they had Christianized and Anglicized these women and civilized, quote unquote, they would then be marriageable prospects to Chinese men in the American West who had no other options to get a bride. And that worked out pretty well here in Butte. Okay, Dr. Wajin Lam had come from China in the 1870s. He was the first graduate of USC Medical School who was of Chinese ethnicity, and he was looking for a bride. And so he came to work in Butte and sent word to the Presbyterian Mission Home and people like Donaldina Cameron that he wanted a bride. They matched him with a woman who eventually goes by the name of Alice, and the marriage was was very much celebrated in the newspapers at the time. Mission ladies give Dr. Lam a bride. Pretty wedding of Chinese couple at the Presbyterian home. This was a success story. This Chinese man who's the first medical doctor from that university that I mentioned, married to somebody who'd been freed from this life of, uh, of service in the brothels. It, it worked out well for the Lam family. They raised seven children in Butte. Okay, now I want to make a fine point here. These children born on American soil achieved American citizenship. The only way for people of Chinese ethnicity at this time to become American citizens. People of Chinese ethnicity, Chinese immigrants were not allowed the process of naturalization. And so the only way to be an American citizen of Chinese ethnicity was to be born on American soil and the Lam children were. Alice went on to teach English and Bible studies at the Chinese Baptist Mission in Butte's Chinatown, and it worked out very well for the Lam family. Okay? The story was not always the case when people were freed from the brothels, the Muay Thai system, specifically for Na Loy and Tom Singh of Bozeman. Tom Singh was a laundry worker in Bozeman, and he was learning English from a, a Protestant missionary named Julia Emery. She was teaching him the Bible, teaching him English, things like that. And they had established a relationship, and it was very much a, a positive relationship. One day, Tom Singh comes to Julia Emery and says, I'm going to get married. And Julia Emery says, quote, but how can you marry? Not a white girl, surely. Yet you don't know any China women. There are no Chinese girls here. Have you bought a Chinese girl, paid six or eight hundred dollars for her, end quote. And Tom Singh assured Julia Emery, no, this is a true love match. He had sent to the Presbyterian Mission Home in San Francisco for a bride, and the bride had arranged a marriage with this woman named Na Loy. She spoke English. Supposedly, Na Loy had been taken from China at age seven in that Muay Thai system and had worked in San Francisco under horrible conditions. Extricated from that by Donaldina Cameron and the Presbyterian Mission Home, she was taught English, she was taught Christianity, she didn't even read or speak Chinese because she was brought here at age seven against her will. And when Julia Emery thought, is this, is this truly a love match? She eventually meets Na Loy, okay? Tom Singh, quote, brought his heathen sweetheart and placed her in my care. She was bright and attractive, spoke and read English fairly well, and seemed perfectly at home in her new surroundings. Close questioning convinced me that this was a true love match, no bargain and sale, as I had feared. 
such as, in com as common in the Pacific Coast region. All they asked was American protection and freedom from molestation. Protection and freedom from molestation was not to be found. They had a happy life in Bozeman for a while. Unfortunately, it seems that Na Loy was promised to another more prominent Chinese man who took out a hit on Tom Singh, Na Loy's husband. Okay. An assassin came from Butte. His name was Lu Singh, no, no relation to Tom Singh. Lu Singh, in the middle of the day, in 1905, downtown Bozeman, hacked Tom Singh to death. He was quickly apprehended, and when asked why he did it, he said that if Tom was dead, he was glad and happy, and that if he was not dead, he was sorry and not a good Chinaman, end quote. So it was a hit that had happened uh, on Tom Singh because Na Loy had probably been promised to a more prominent Chinese man. Unfortunately, in the investigation of the assassination of Tom Singh, it was found that Na Loy didn't have the proper paperwork to be in America. <coughs> Why would she? She was brought as a sexual slave at age seven. She was arrested for not having the proper paperwork, jailed steps away from her husband's assassin. Okay. Proceedings were put forward to deport Na Loy, and people across the state, as far as Billings, took up her case. Quote, just what is to be gained by the deportation is not quite clear, except that the letter of the law is to be followed. The woman does not speak a word of her native language or write Chinese, according to the dispatches from Bozeman. She's educated in English, is a member of the Presbyterian Church, and lives an exemplary Christian life despite all of this. She is spent to be sent back to China, a strange country to her, where she will probably meet her death or torture. Petitions, appeals, things of that nature were circulated around the state. The cause was eventually elevated to President Theodore Roosevelt, who could do nothing. It's likely that white Montanans sympathized, sympathized with Naloy because she could speak English, she was Christian, the tragedy of her husband's death. Ultimately, she was deported. What eventually happened to Naloy, she's fallen off the historic record. Okay. There was a loophole that allowed for a little bit easier marriage. Merchants could bring in a wife. If you were a Chinese merchant who had gained legal entry, which was allowed from the 1882 Chinese Exclusion Act, you could bring in a bride. And so here we have a document from a woman in Butte. She carried this on her person at all times, attesting that her husband was in fact a merchant. And so hopefully this provided her some security as she walked the streets of Butte. Oftentimes though, traveling, a merchant to travel all the way back to China to find a bride was quite difficult. So oftentimes what happened was an arranged marriage where the families would get together and arrange a marriage and that happened frequently. Quote, I was married by proxy. A live rooster symbolized the bridegroom. A month after the ma marriage, I sailed for America with my husband's relatives. On the day the boat docked at Port Townsend, he pointed a to a figure walking up and down the wharf. He said, see that man smoking a big cigar? He's your husband. And arranged marriages were not uncommon in, in southern China at this time period, assuming the elders and family members had the best interests of their family and the young ones at, at heart. But for American officials, they often thought that these arranged marriages might be ways to secret Chinese women in for what? prostitution. So American officials claimed, quote, the China man would have to demonstrate to me that this woman is his wife according to our ideas of marriage. I don't know exactly how you would do that, but eventually they relented and did allow for arranged marriages to be a thing. This was the case for the family of Hamwa Long, a Butte merchant who arranged a marriage and produced a number of children born on American soil. The most prominent of them is Rose Hum Lee. Rose Hum Lee, I hear some nods of, of, of recognition, a very prominent academic and figure in American Chinese studies. She was born in Butte in 1904, thus an American citizen. She goes on to get a great education, become the first woman and first Asian American to head an American department, a university department, and has quite a successful life as an academic. But what were her marriage prospects? What were her marriage prospects? Who could she marry? Again, 1909 to 1953, anti-miscegenation says nobody of Chinese ethnicity can marry outside their race. And yet, are there many Chinese American men here? Not that many. This gets complicated. In 1907, there was something called the Expatriation Act, which said that a woman's citizenship status traveled with that of her husband. Expatriation Act, a woman's citizenship status traveled with that of her husband. So when Rose Hum Lee marries a Chinese citizen, her American citizenship is lost. Birthright citizenship gained by being born in Butte America, Butte America of all places, right? 
she loses her citizenship upon marrying a Chinese national. When they divorce, she is unable to regain her citizenship because Chinese cannot nat naturalize. And so eventually she does get her citizenship back. But to be honest, this caused her great mental anguish of feeling trapped in between different cultures and different societies. Her work and her study on the Chinese in Butte, Montana, and the Rocky Mountain region is very important, but if you read between the lines, there's this anguish of being caught in limbo. Okay. Here in Helena, Chinese merchant Li Sam Fong tried to go back to China to get a bride. To do that, he got this letter signed by 22 prominent Montanans, some former Supreme Court justices, uh, bishops, former governors, saying we attest that Li Sam Fong is a good guy. He has this piece of paper, he goes back to China, finds a bride, and brings her back to hopefully live a happy life in Helena. That was in 1890. In 1893, they welcomed their first child. Lee Sam Fong is a little bit nervous. As his wife is going into labor, he goes to the local fire station and asks for help. Firemen come and help, and it is said that, quote, the first Chinese baby born in lawful wedlock in Helena happened last night. But the firemen, quote, feared that the U.S. Marshal will be after them for having assisted in bringing a Chinaman into this country. <laughs> a little bit of a joke, but then the newspaper goes on to say she has citizenship. And because of that, she can go, go to and come back from China as she pleases, being an American citizen. Right? We know that uh, citizenship meant more than just being able to travel to China and come back. It also, in Montana, meant voting rights. Right. After 1914, women gained the right to vote in Montana, and the Lee sisters try to register to vote in 1916. When they go to register, the clerk of the court, quote, was not sure they were entitled to registration, due not to their gender, but their ethnicity. When he checked more, he elevated these uh, issues to the county attorney, and it was finally determined that they were, quote, qualified under the law to have all the rights of other women in the state. When asked for whom they would vote, each sister said she was going to vote for the best man. Of course, we know in 1916 in Montana they had other options as well. <laughs> going a little bit further east, Annie Louie in Billings was a modern Chinese woman as well. If you can marry, what else can you do? Divorce. And Annie Louie of Billings supposedly filed for what was undoubtedly the first petition of divorce ever filed in the state which both the plaintiff and the defendant are Chinese. This is in 1901 in, in Billings, and it gained a lot of headlines and, and newspaper ink spilt about this empowered Chinese woman taking her life into her own hands, right? She talked not just about her divorce, but about her ideas on reform and on collaboration with non-Chinese people and on labor union activism. And so she was described, quote, dainty, petite, and 21 years of age. She is remarkably handsome for a Chinese woman. <laughs> Instead of competing with American work, workmen, Chinese people will occupy their niche in the world and all will work to a common end. The betterment of the condition of mankind. This is from Annie Louie. She is, such is the dream of little Annie Louie, who is an American, who with American notions, has some very broad ideas of reform. She believes that her Mongolian brethren would make valuable and worthy members of labor unions, where they only taught what it means. She purposes doing just that. Her plan is simple enough. She would join a labor organization herself and teach the doctrines in every city in the United States where there is a Chinese laundry or tea store. A very laudable ambition, is it not? She cherishes the plan to redeem her countrymen from the race prejudice which exists. She secured em employment in a Billings restaurant where she is still working and studying for the time when she will start upon her evangelical work. I don't know what happened to Annie Louie, but it's a moment of empowerment and just uh, in an exciting moment for, for the Chinese people in Montana. Outside of Montana, I think it, it gets even more interesting. A woman born to the name Ahi Yong will go by her stage name, Su Yong. Ahi Yong is born in the territory of Hawaii in 1903, thus an American citizen. She excels at education, in fact, wants to become a teacher. She wants to go to Columbia University in New York City to teach. But getting from the territory of Hawaii into mainland and to New York was difficult, even though she had American citizenship. In 1927, when she tries to do that, she's eventually let in with a qualified status of being Chinese in America, even though she's an American citizen. She goes to Columbia and excels. She's one of 50 Chinese, Asian American women studying in higher education at the time period. But not only does she want to teach, she wants to act. 
And at night, she spends her times on Broadway and gets a lot of roles in, in uh, the emerging acting industry. Her Chinese cultural knowledge, along with uh, that acting experience, paid off. This is Peking Opera. This is Beijing Opera. And the most famed Peking Opera actor, Mei Lan Fang, was doing an American tour. Mei Lan Fang came to New York and required a mistress of ceremonies. And so Su Yong, who is the stage name of Ahi Yong, the woman born in Hawaii, serves as this role. And it said, Mr. May is supported by his own company of actors, dancers, and musicians. In four short plays and dances, the meaning of which is fully explained before each scene by the charming mistress of ceremonies, Miss Su Yong. And this was a hit. Tickets sold out like you couldn't believe. $500 for a table, $1,000 for a balcony seat, and we're talking 1931-32. <laughs> Mei Lan Fong travels from New York to San Francisco, and Ahi Yong, or Su Yong, is with him the whole time. But as she's doing this, she meets some interesting people, Chinese businessmen, American business leaders, and she meets a gentleman from Montana named R.A. Brett, who has mining interests. And so Su Yong, and Ahi Yong, Su Yong, and R.A. Brett begin collaborating and Su Young is taken with the idea of mining in Montana in the 1930s. And so she, said, she is claimed to be the only Chinese woman mining engineer in the world. <laughs> Since her arrival in Butte four months ago, she has acquired an intense interest and enthusiasm for mining prospects. She intends to devote her life to mining engineering and is at pre present studying under R.A. Brett, president of the Winnetka Company. Later, she expects to seek a formal engineering education. And in this article from Hawaii, she comments on not just her ambitions in the 1930s, but her knowledge of the, Ch the role of Chinese miners back to Bannock, Grasshopper Creek, Alder Gulch, and the like. She says, Chinese once mined in the plasters of Alder Gulch, and it is altogether fitting that one of the race should aid in bringing a renaissance in the famous camp. I feel that mining engineering is not only a natural, but a worthy ambition for a Chinese girl. Only I shall have to be a good miner to live up to the traditions of the race. And so she's got some interesting ambitions in Montana. She also had ambitions outside of Montana and Hollywood. And her Hollywood career takes off, taking her away from that mining engineering work. She acts alongside Greta Garbo in The Painted Veil, Mae West in Klondike Annie, Clark Gable and Jean Harlow in China Seas, and Gary Cooper in The Adventures of Marco Polo. She tries to get the lead role in the adaptation of Pearl Buck's novel, The Good Earth, and she wants to play Olan, the, the main character in the movie. And Su Young, Ahi Young says, she was eager to play Olan, the central character of the film. I want to play her as an intelligent, respectful Chinese wife, not a stupid woman who takes her husband's blows without complaint. I want to make her the great kind of woman I knew in my own village, the Chinese woman unknown to the American screen. She did not get the role, and in fact, nobody of Asian ethnicity got that role. It was played by a German-born actress. Okay? She did have two roles in the film, and her career in Hollywood was long and storied. Her last credit was in Magnum P.I. <laughs> right? Bringing it kind of close to at least my childhood and close to the present. Okay? But she noted that Chinese women are, are quite as modern as American women. They have representatives in almost every profession. She did visit Montana frequently up through the 1950s, specifically Billings, and she developed a one-woman play. It was called Out from the Inner Apartment, and it looked at Chinese women as modern and empowered, depicted the changing status of Chinese women during the last 25 years. She presented that frequently in Billings. I haven't seen much on that, but I know that she maintained those friendships and came back to speak of the changing status, the changing role of Chinese women in America, Montana, and the world. And so through the efforts of people like Sue Young, Rose Humley, Annie Louie, Alice Lam, the Lee sisters, and more, Chinese Montanans, Chinese women emerge as far more complex and fully formed than as the anonymous, quote, China woman on the 1870 census. Instead, they come to us with vibrancy, complexity, agency, shaped by and shaping events in Montana and the nation. By recovering the voices of Montana's Chinese residents, and by seeing their experiences in the context of Montana, Chinese, and world history, we see them as they saw themselves, as hardworking family members with responsibilities that stretch thousands of miles, as activists seeking to build bridges between white and Chinese workers, and as reformers engaged in a global struggle to remake their homeland and themselves through their experiences in the American West. Thank you very much.
about 10 minutes. Perfect. Perfect. Yeah. We do have some time for questions, so if anyone has some questions for Mark, please feel free. I think there's, how do we turn that on? I asked for some softball questions from this table, so I expect some hands here in just a second. <laughs> time for questions. What was the method for securely uh, transmitting funds? Ah. This question always comes up, and I'm glad you asked it. The method for transmitting funds that were earned in Butte or Helena or Belgrade back to southern China. Okay, Venmo. <laughs> WeChat. No. no, that's the method today. Great question. There were three ways, basically, to do it. You could send remittances, send money that would keep families alive with a returning family member. Okay, that was the most... Trustworthy, but least frequent. And in the letters we translated, we see all of these three. So send it with the cousin, send it with brother, somebody going back and giving it to the parents. That was the least frequent, but most trustworthy. The second was for a 5% fee of what you were sending, you could hire a courier, and that courier would be duty bound to then take it to your home village and deliver it to the person to whom it was addressed. We saw that referenced in the documents as well. That wasn't used that frequently. The far most frequent was for a 2% fee, you could use a Chinese mercantile. For instance, down in Butte, where I'm gonna race off after this talk because we're celebrating Mooncake Festival this afternoon, uh, there's the Hua Chong Tai Mercantile. And this served a number of different resources for the community. It served as a bank in some ways. And so you could go through the mercantile, they would pool workers' money take a 2% fee, they wouldn't then send your dollar earned in Butte back down to southern China. What merchants do is make money, and so they would get their finger on the pulse of what was needed in southern China and buy commodities here or in San Francisco, use that money to buy commodities here that would then be sold in Hong Kong for a profit. The merchants would take that profit, dole out your money to your families, and take their 2% cut. That was by far the most common way to send money. And it were, in the letters, we see all three. Occasionally, we hear about it breaking down, but far more frequently, we hear thanks for the remittance you sent, thanks for this, we got it from the cousin, we got it from the courier, we got it from the Gold Mountain firm, those were called. Good question. In Portland, Wells Fargo published pamphlets in China, and they would help transfer also. Yep, and so it, in, in cities along the west coast there'd be Chinese uh, people who could speak English as well and try to facilitate this. And when those remittances got down to Hong Kong, usually there'd be letters that would go out to the local villages saying, hey, you've got a, a transfer that's been sent. Yeah, not only were, were monies sent, bones were sent as well. The Chinese who died here in the American West did not hope that their bones would reside forever outside of China, and so they would be interred. For about five to seven years, their bones would then be exhumed, respectfully cleaned, and sent back to southern China for burial at the home village because descendants needed to honor the ancestors and there were not many descendants here. As Chinese Montanans began more and more to think about Montana as home, they did begin investing in headstones rather than just a wooden board. And so a recent project that I've completed through the funding of the Foundation for Montana History looks at Chinese headstones and cemeteries across Montana. Here in Helena, there's a, an important Chinese cemetery, Bozeman, Butte, Billings, Livingston. And so we've translated and interpreted those headstones and identified the individual and their home village back in southern China. That's all available at my website at bigskychinese.com. So you can check out that, that map and those, those sites across Montana. Yeah. Yep. He also served in World War II. Great question. So how did somebody become somebody of Chinese ethnicity become a naturalized citizen in the fifties, as you said, and serve in World War II? The Magnuson Act of nineteen forty three cancelled out Chinese exclusion. Why would 1943 be important in American-Chinese relations? Okay, right? The Chinese are fighting the Japanese, America is fighting the Japanese. It's pretty unsightly to have a Chinese Exclusion Act against a key ally. And so the Magnuson Act canceled that and then allowed for naturalization. In canceling the Chinese Exclusion Act that had been in place from 1882 to 1943, the door was not exactly flung wide open. After it was ended, 105 Chinese per year were allowed in. 
I didn't miss any zeros. 105 Chinese were allowed. So it was in name and a geopolitical uh, olive branch to our allies there. But then naturalization could absolutely take place. The Chinese and Chinese Americans did serve in World War II through the great work of Ken Robison. I also know that they served in World War I as well. Okay, we've got examples. Uh, a Chinese man was not welcomed in, in Great Falls, my hometown, barred Chinese from settling from 1885 to 1941. Check it out in the most recent edition of Montana, the magazine of Western history. But this Chinese baseball player, the first Chinese American baseball player was set to come through and play the, uh, the, the Great Falls Electrics in 1916. And the word was that if he came to Great Falls, he was gonna be thrown in the river, just like the first Chinese resident of Montana, of Great Falls, okay? He left baseball and then went to serve in the Allied Expeditionary Force against the, the Germans in France. And so they wouldn't allow him in Great Falls, but they would allow him to take up arms to serve the nation, okay? Complicated history. I just wondered why you said that they've all come from southern China. Yeah. Question is, why are they all coming from southern China? Um, and did they ever come from other parts? Of course, they came from other parts as well, but the vast majority came from Guangdong province, just outside of Canton or Guangzhou, and more specifically, Taishan County. And there's a couple of reasons for that. That area, geographically speaking, is closer to Southeast Asia and had, had, had a, a history of out-migration for work all the way back to the Ming Dynasty, just with its geographic proximity and the cultural tradition of going out to Malaysia, Indonesia, and places like that. And sadly, in the late Qing Dynasty, that area of southern China was beset by horrible, horrible conditions. Wars, rebellions, typhoons, famines, epidemics, floods, droughts had ravaged that area of Guangdong, specifically Taishan, and so it was said that they simply must go out to work. So about 80% of the Chinese who came to America were from that very small part of southern China. Question. Um, given Sanders' early uh, statements about the, the Chinese, do you have any thoughts about the case with Pop yeah. and Butte and the Union? Yeah, yeah. And Pops their case. Great question. So Wilbur Fisk Sanders, who said that, you know, we want them to be diminished to extinction here in Montana, also served as a lawyer and fought for the Chinese rights in Butte in 1897. There was a major um, white-supported labor union boycott against the Chinese to force them economically from Butte. And they, they took up a collection. They tried to get a lawyer from San Francisco. The Chinese six companies said, do not fight the white-controlled labor unions. Keep your head down. The Chinese in Butte said, we're going to fight them. They took up a collection of about $1,000 and secured the services of Wilbur Fisk Sanders, who out of one side of his mouth is saying we want to diminish them to extinction, and out of another side of his mouth is filing briefs and fighting for their rights in court. And how do I make sense of that? He's a politician. It's complicated. It's complicated. Yep. I think um, with kind of bimetallism and Democratic, Republican, Times uh, policies at the time period. I don't think uh, Sanders was terribly welcomed in Butte, and I almost wonder if this was a way to kind of stick it to Butte a little bit. I'm not sure. I'd, li I'd like to add, though. Yeah. Uh, he resigned his commission over the refusal to return black slaves to yeah. the Yeah. Uh, some people think he was injured in the war, he wasn't. Yeah. Uh, but then he aided a fellow by the name of Frank Mitchell, a runaway slave. Yep. Great point. He's complicated. So he had some very progressive views on African-American uh, comrades throughout the American West and some, at times, quite hateful views towards Chinese. He's complicated, as we all are. And, uh, you know, I think if we look back at our own stances and, and statements, we might find some inconsistencies as well. He was just so prominent that it's, it's writ pretty large. Yeah, um, so Chinese men mainly would come over, mm -hmm. uh, do work, and then go back to China? Yep. Um, is there any historical memory back in China of these experiences? I mean, do people yeah. have memories or recollections about Good question. Really yeah. Good question. So, you know, the back and forth and moving back to southern China, are there any histories in southern China, family histories or other, that speak about the Chinese experience in the American West? There are some. 
but honestly not much. The, the class of people coming over to America and going out for work did not view themselves as terribly historically important. Um, and in fact, when we first tried to translate these letters, so I rediscovered these letters in about 2010, 2011. I wasn't the first to discover them. But the Montana Historical Society had tried to translate them twice in the 1980s. The first attempt, I might need you to turn off the camera for this one. Um, my alma mater of, of Carroll College had two students from China who were studying there and were caught shoplifting. And their community service was to go to the Montana Historical Society and try to translate these documents. <laughs> um, they didn't do a very good job, but nobody knew that they didn't do a very good job, right? And the Montana Historical Society in 88, when it acquired these collections, sent three of the letters to a linguist at the University of Montana who was from northern China and could interpret some of these letters. His estimation was they deal with family affairs and they are of no historical significance. He was right about the first part. But my point is, I think in Chinese culture, for Chinese people, history is Tang Dynasty, Song Dynasty, 5,000 years of emperors and generals, and the common man did not seem to merit study as much as it has after new social history from the 60s and 70s here in America. Yeah. One more question. None of the softballs up here? Come on. Okay, yeah. Mark, thank you. Um, I have a question for I was a historian from the Reformation for 12 years. And always in the old country, they say, oh, well, the Chinese built dams and yeah. all this other stuff. And I said, well, you can't. That didn't happen because from 1900 to 1943, Every single reclamation contracts to these mm -hmm. of Mongolia. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And they were shocked to know that I said, yes, but you could not make a deal. Did you find anything else like that? They were specifically banned from being employed. Great question. So what did the Chinese do for work here? Did they build this? Did they build that? Uh, they helped build the infrastructure of Montana, absolutely, and the American West, absolutely. But at times, that help was in laundry work, was in restaurant work, was as, as cooks at Fort McGinnis and things like that. We oftentimes think of Chinese coming here to mine gold. They absolutely did, but they were pushed out of the plaster mining pretty soon into it. In 1872, there was an act to try and disallow them from owning mining claims. Whether that was enforced or not, it, it's spotty. They absolutely built the railroad, but then the Japanese crews really maintained the railroad. What I'm finding in the census records, for instance, in 1900, the first uh, occupation for the Chinese in Montana was laundry, second was restaurant work, and the third was gardening. Okay. Now on that, they mined gold here in the American West. They didn't mine gold back home. They built railroads across the Sierra Nevadas and the Rockies. They didn't do that back home. What did they do back home? Farming. And so that's the one moment of continuity, economically speaking. They farmed back in southern China, and they allowed the mountains and plains of Montana to produce vegetables in quantities and varieties, and at times of year, that astonished white customers in Montana. Look for that in uh, next year's Montana, the magazine of Western history, <laughs> if they'll have my article on Chinese vegetable garden. Thank you very much.